So first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to uh, give the talk. Um, so I think we can start without any further ado and we can delve uh, into the philosophical questions regarding the existence of space and time. Now, why is that uh, so interesting? Because, well, space and time uh, intuitively are two touchstones of reality. If I ask you to come up uh, with a reality criterion for an object, uh, most likely you will say something like, well, an object is real just in case it is placed in space at a certain time. So you can see that space and time are very powerful concepts that enter our metaphysics, but also our everyday view of reality. So it's uh, very, uh, very important to um, ask uh, about the ontological status of space and time. Are space and time real entities? Uh, or are they just uh, uh, fictions? And if they're real, uh, um, what kind of uh, reality do they enjoy? So, of course, as you can imagine, uh, these uh, kind of um, debate regarding the metaphysics of space and time uh, goes back uh, basically to uh, the start of uh, human thought. But uh, just to make things a little bit more sharp, I will just um, um, limit my, uh, my discussion to two broad uh, positions that are very well delineated in the literature. So the first is substantivalism. Substantivalism is a very uh, straightforwardly realist uh, stance with respect of space and time. So it maintains that space and time exist independently of material objects. What does that mean? Well, imagine our universe, imagine that we make all the material objects disappear from the universe all at once, according to a substantivalist, still in the universe would remain something, and that something would be space and time. The second position, which is somehow opposed to substantivalism, is relationalism. For relationalists, special and temporal facts depend, in an ontological sense, on facts about the spatial and temporal relations between bodies. And this means that, for example, the fact that I am 15 centimeters away from the screen of my computer depends on the fact that both I and the computer exist. If uh, none of us would have existed, then that would have made no sense to talk about 50 centimeters being here. Okay, so in this sense, uh, Relationalism is a much less realistic stance with respect of space and time. For sure, there are no such objects as space and time. Now, the kind of debate between substantivalism and relationalism is for sure interesting for philosophical and metaphysical uh, purposes, but it has also a huge bearing on physics because, for example, in classical physics, we recognize a privileged class of motions that we call inertial motions. Those motions are uh, the motion of bodies that are not acted upon by any net force. And these objects tend to move with uniform rectilinear motion. And this is an important concept in classical physics. So, you see that in order to come up with a physically meaningful uh, definition of inertial motion, we need to be clear about uh, uh, what is that that motion takes place relative to. Okay, so this is where we can trace uh, a connection between metaphysics and physics. So historically, we can start from René Descartes, a mathematician, and a philosopher. So for the car, all motion is just the relative motion of bodies. So basically, he can be um, considered a relationalist. 
And uh, according to him, basically we can describe motion by means of any bodies we care to choose. So we want to describe the motion of a planet. Well, just choose whatever reference body you want, the earth, the sun, the stars, anything will do for um, describing the motion of this planet. So you see that his attitude is very, very uh, liberal. But this has a huge problem because um, emotion that can be straight and uniform with respect to some reference body will for sure not be so with respect to others. And to give you an example, let's consider uh, a disc with a ball on it. And uh, imagine that we want to describe the motion of this ball on the disc while the disc is rotating. Now, in order to do so, we can choose ad libitum, according to the card, two different points of view. For example, here we have the point of view of someone outside the rotating disc, while here we have the point of view, this red dot here, of someone who moves together with the disc. Now, according to the card, the description of motion of the black ball will be basically uh, can be chosen arbitrarily between the two. But what happens here? Let's try to make the ball move together with the rotating disc. Okay, oh. this is uh, the experiment that I wanted to show you. Okay, so in one case we had uniform rectilinear motion. In the other case, uh, we had crooked motion, right? So that's, that is why Cartesian relationalism is, seems to be um, not enough to account for um, inertial motion. So what about all the other, um, all the other uh, inertial effects? So uh, Isaac Newton started and tried to find a, uh, an answer to this question about Cartesian relationalism. So, he devised a, a thought experiment, which is called uh, aptly the, um, uh, the bucket experiment. So basically here you have a bucket uh, filled with water, uh, which hangs from uh, a rope. So what we do is basically to twist the rope and let it unwind freely. So once we do that, the rope will start spinning and the bucket will spin uh, with it. But at this stage, still the water will be uh, at rest. At a certain point, due to uh, frictional forces uh, between the uh, molecules of the water and those of uh, the walls of the bucket, also the water will start spinning. And at this point, we will see a uh, an effect due to centrifugal forces, which is uh, this concavity in the surface of the water. Now, the concavity here is greatly exaggerated, okay? But I hope you, uh, uh, you have in mind the kind of effect that you would uh, observe in the uh, bucket uh, of water. So in the end, the uh, rope will end uh, the unwinding so the bucket will be at rest, but still for a while the water will be rotating, so we will be seeing this concavity, and in the end we will be back to this full rest position. So having this experimental setting uh, in, uh, in mind, we have to ask the following question. Is relative motion, that is the relative motion of the bucket with respect of the water, necessary and sufficient to account for inertial effects? Well, first of all, it is not necessary because you can have iner inertial effects without relative motion. And this is the case C. Here you have that both the bucket and the water are spinning in the same direction. So relationally speaking, there is no uh, relational motion, but still you have your concavity in the surface of the water. But there's more. The relational motion is not even sufficient because you can have relative motion without inertial effects. And this is the case uh, B. 
Um, so basically here, the relative motion of the bucket with respect of the water is, uh, that does not show this uh, concavity. So in general, you can have that the very same relational motion between the bucket and the water, so the case B and D, which are exactly the same from a relationalist point of view, may or may not give rise to the concavity of the water. So basically, Newton showed that the Cartesian brand of relationalism is not enough for uh, accounting for any of the important features of uh, classical mechanics. So what he did when he wrote his Principia Mathematica Philosophiae Naturalis was to add a scolium uh, where he basically postulated the existence of something that helped the physicist make sense of inertial motions and all other inertial effects. And of course, he started postulating an absolute uh, true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external. He also postulated an absolute space, which in its own nature, without regard to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Now, why did he postulate these structures? Because now, with absolute space and absolute time in place, he was able to define motion in a way that wasn't ambiguous anymore. Because now, he has access to the kind of motion which is called absolute. Now, all observers, all points of view would agree on absolute motion. So from this point of view, uh, classical mechanics would have been grounded on firm concept. We wouldn't have any ambiguity anymore. Now, you might ask, is Newton a substantivalist? Well, he, he is so, of course, but not so uh, simply. He's a substantivalist because, of course, when he thinks about attributes of extension and duration, he thinks that those things must have some substance to support it. So he needs some substance. But what he thinks about space and time as substances is quite peculiar. For him, those are sui generi substances. So they are not substances as material objects are. Why is it so? Well, because if, if you think about the way space and time define a standard of uh, motion, of inertial motion, if you want, uh, they do not do so by pushing literally uh, physical bodies. So in some sense, the kind of influence that space and time have on material bodies is uh, uh, something, uh, let's say, sui generis, once again. But is Newton just a substantivalist? No, it is uh, much more than that. Uh, because first of all, for Newton, absolute space and time are necessary beings. And this means that, for example, God might have chosen different laws of motion, but he had no alternative but to place and move bodies in space and time. This is a very strong. So not even God might have had motion without space and time. So those things are necessary if you want motion. But for him, space and time were also uh, immutable. So it makes no sense to think, I don't know, of this region of space uh, and that this might have been different from uh, how it is now. For Newton, this is just nonsense. Space and time are immutable. They are there irrespective of what happens uh, in the, uh, among physical uh, bodies. So Newton is more than a substantivalist. He is an absolutist. And this is an important point because uh, sometimes in the literature, uh, the world, uh, the words uh, absolute space and time, substantival space and time are 
conflated, but we cannot do that, strictly speaking, because an absolutist is a substantivalist, but the other way around does not hold uh, necessarily. Okay? Um, so, does Newton have the upper hand in the debate uh, in the context of classical mechanics? Well, this guy begs to differ. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz, as a mathematician and a, a philosopher, um, uh, wanted to, uh, let's say, object to uh, Newton's views. For Leibniz, Newtonian space and times are metaphysically suspicious structures. Uh, he calls them a uh, red herring, something that distracts us from the physics. And uh, in order to show us why uh, Newtonian space and time are such red herring, um, he mounted two uh, famous arguments. Now, I'm going to give you a very simple and modern rendition of these two arguments. The first is the argument from static shift. So how does this argument go? Well, imagine the universe, imagine the entire material distribution over uh, the universe, and now imagine a situation in which this entire material distribution is taken and translated rigidly five meters to the left. When I say rigidly, I uh, intend that uh, in doing so, we do not change in any way all the relative distances and angles among uh, the uh, objects in the universe. Now, when we do so, we are generating, according to Newton, a different situation because the situation in which the uh, entire material content of the universe is uh, translated five meters to the left uh, is different because different uh, uh, space points are occupied in this second uh, situation. However, if you think about that, these two ontologically different situation would not uh, have been observable because for any kind of measurement you could have performed from inside the universe, there is no way to tell one possibility from uh, the other. And this is, of course, a bit of a problem because uh, uh, Newton introduced absolute space and time exactly to make sense of the physics. But now it seems that these very um, structures are in some sense uh, uh, transparent to physics, which is something that for sure we don't want. And uh, <clears throat> Leibniz went even farther and uh, uh, mounted a similar argument involving kinematic shifts. So basically now imagine the entire a material distribution of the universe at rest with respect to absolute space, and imagine another situation in which this material distribution rigidly moves of uh, uniform rectilinear motion, that is inertial motion. Now we know from uh, classical physics that when there is inertial motion, no inertial effects arise. So there are no forces or acceleration that can help us tell one situation, that is the absolute rest, from the other, that is the absolute inertial motion from the universe. So once again, here we have a situation in which we have ontologically different situations, according to Newton, that makes no uh, observable physical difference, okay? So this is uh, uh, the, the point that Leibniz makes uh, uh, against Newton. He, he says, okay, you want to say physics, but uh, it seems that your postulation goes, uh, is, is at, at odds uh, with physics, if you want. So what are Leibniz's views uh, uh, regarding uh, space and time? So according to him, uh, we form a notion of space by considering uh, uh, many things uh, that coexist, that exist at once. And what does that mean? Well, basically things coexist just in case they are related in a 
spatial arrangement. So if there is some sort of distance relation that holds uh, among them. So for him, there is no such thing as an absolute uh, background space. We just have uh, material objects and distance relations among them. When we talk about a background space, we are just talking about a mathematical fiction that we use just to make uh, more sense of the equation, to make, let's say, the calculations more uh, tractable. The same position he holds with respect of absolute time. For him, there is no such thing as a universal clock that ticks irrespective of what happens in the rest uh, of the universe. The only thing that happens is that the distance relation holding among material bodies uh, tend to change, okay? And this change is ordered and has a direction. So when we uh, want to label the different stages of this change, we come up with a series of moments and uh, basically it is us once again that are ordering a series of moments in a stack uh, but just for uh, let's say our own uh, um, descriptive purposes there is no such thing as this universal external uh, ticking clock so if you want here is a, a, a picture of how more or less uh, uh, Leibniz uh, think about its metaphysics. So for example, imagine that the universe is made up of only five uh, uh, point particles. So basically here we have these particles which coexist because they are related by these spatial or distance relations, if you want. Now what happens is that these relations tend to change. So for in this case, this relation here changes to that. So these two particles become, uh, let's say, more uh, wider, wider arranged, okay? And the same happens for all the other relations in the configuration. And this happens again and again and again. So we have different stages, uh, each uh, of which uh, feature a complete uh, spatial configuration of material bodies. Now, when we want to give labels to these subsequent order of changing configuration, we come up with this tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. So here is the ordering that we call time. But as you can see here, there is no uh, uh, embedding uh, space for this configuration and neither an embedding time for these moments. Once again, as I told you, those things are just mathematical constructions that we use uh, for our descriptive uh, purposes. So to recap, for Leibniz, space is the order of coexisting things, while time is the order of changing things. Coexistence is defined by uh, a primitive uh, distance relation. So two things coexist just in case they are related by a distance or a spatial relations. While for uh, the um, case of time, we have some sort of fundamental change uh, relation that holds among uh, these arrangements of uh, material objects. So as you can see, and you have already uh, guest, Leibniz is a relationalist, but appreciate how Leibniz's brand of relationalism is much more structured than the uh, Cartesian uh, one. So Leibniz's uh, point is that Newton is committed to much more structure than required by classical mechanics. His arguments from static and kinematic shifts is there to uh, prove that. And this point is absolutely well taken. However, if you think about that, uh, Newton's original argument against Descartes still applies to Leibnizian relationalism, 
even if uh, Leibnizian relationalism is uh, more structured than the uh, Cartesian one. Uh, so not even Leibniz postulates enough structure to uh, back up uh, classical uh, mechanics. And uh, this is clear uh, that the bucket argument uh, hits Leibnizian relationalism as it does for the Cartesian brand. Um, so, if we ask if Leibniz is able to, um, uh, uh, to reduce the facts about the water surface concavity to relational facts involving the motion of the bucket relative to the water, he is not able as well. So, it seems that uh, Newton here has the upper hand in the debate in the context of uh, classical mechanics. However, in uh, uh, more recent times, uh, the Austrian uh, mathematician and physicist Ernst Mach gave a new spin to the uh, bucket uh, argument and wanted to, let's say, object to uh, uh, Newton's way to, uh, of drawing conclusions from the bucket argument. So for Mach, uh, the only uh, fair conclusion that the bucket argument can uh, deliver is that the relative rotation of the water with respect to, to the sides of the bucket produces no noticeable centrifugal forces. And that's okay. However, Newton went too far because he just concludes that uh, uh, relational motions to cool are <clears throat> unable to account for those centrifugal forces. But according to Mach, this is not the case because such forces are produced by the relative rotation of the bucket with respect of the surrounding material distribution. And that means the entire material distribution of the celestial bodies uh, around uh, the, uh, the, the water. So the Earth, uh, the other planets in the solar system, the uh, far away stars. If we repeat the buckets experiment with uh, this new information at our disposal, so now we refer the rotation of the water, not to the bucket anymore, but to the, let's say, the background of fixed stars, you see that things make sense. Now, whenever there is a rotation of the water relative to the surrounding celestial bodies distribution, we do have a, a water surface concavity. But when the water is at rest with respect to the uh, fixed uh, background of the uh, stars, then there is no water concavity anymore. Okay? So in this way, Mach is able to diffuse Newton's challenge. And this, uh, this view is very incisive because it implies a very important change in, the, uh, in perspective. Because uh, one of the key insights that Ernst Mach uh, gave to the debate is that local inertial effects are determined or at least influenced by the global surrounding material distribution. So Newton was, um, uh, let's say, used the, uh, the bucket as a red herring, if you want, to distract us from the fact that we should have to uh, concentrate on the entire material distribution uh, of uh, the universe. And uh, in recent times, in the last four decades, in fact, the British physicist Julian Barbour and his collaborators have developed, in fact, a version of classical mechanics uh, that starts uh, from purely Leibnizian or uh, Machian uh, principles. However, 
this uh, would uh, deserve a, a talk on its own. So let's leave it at that. But what is important is that, that even before Barbour, someone else uh, took uh, Mach insight very seriously and used Mach's uh, insights uh, in order to develop his own theory of space and time. And uh, this person I'm referring to is, of course, Albert Einstein, who uh, incorporated uh, um, or wanted to do so uh, this uh, Machian uh, principle uh, that matter influences inertia in his uh, theory of space time, which is uh, general relativity. So now it would be uh, interesting to see how the debate between substantivalism and relationalism uh, is translated to the context of general relativity. Now, in order to do so, let me very briefly introduce you to uh, the, um, uh, let's say, machinery of general relativity. The most important ingredient is, of course, the Einstein's uh, field uh, equations. They can very concisely and simply be written in this way here. Now, here G is a mathematical object, it's called the Einstein tensor. The important point is that this object encodes the information regarding the four-dimensional uh, geometry of space-time. So now space and time are merged to, to, together in a unique thing called space-time. On the right-hand side of the equation, we have the stress-energy tensor T, which encodes information about the distribution of matter in space-time. And K is just a proportionality constant. So here we have space-time, here we have matter, very crudely speaking. Now, uh, in the following, I will refer to a model of GR, of general relativity, whenever I talk about a solution of this equation here. Now, there can be solutions of Einstein's equations where G and T represent the space-time geometry and the material content of the entire universe. So this kind of models, I will refer to as cosmological uh, models of uh, GR. Now, if you want, if, you're, if you are a metaphysician, you can think about uh, a cosmological model of GR as some sort of possible world where general relativity holds. Now, as you can see, it is very simple to grasp the main idea uh, behind Einstein's field equation. The idea is basically that space-time and matter interact. So there is a very nice motto who is adopted in one of the most important books on general relativity, which I think conveys the idea very nicely. So space acts on matter, telling it how to move, and in turn, matter reacts back on space, telling it how to curve. So here uh, you can see the uh, main shift in perspective from Newtonian gravitation to general relativity. In the classical theory, gravity was a force exerted by a massive body on a smaller one, for example, I don't know, a particle, such that it bent its trajectory so that the particle uh, didn't move anymore of uniform rectilinear motion, but bent its uh, trajectory because of this force. In the case of general relativity, it is not like that. Now, the massive body just changes the geometry of the surrounding space-time region. And what the uh, uh, particle does is to continue moving in a uh, straight line. But now the straight line will be the one of a new curved geometry, not anymore the uh, flat uh, Euclidean geometry we are acquainted to. So here there are no forces anymore. There is just the geometry of space-time that changes. So in this sense, uh, we can say that GR unifies gravity and uh, space-time because basically the theory 
equates gravitational forces to curvature effects of space-time geometry. So, prima facie, uh, you can say that uh, the picture of space-time in general relativity is one in which space-time has some physical properties, for example, curvature. And so you can take it as a hint that the general relativistic space-time is something that exists over and above material fields. So you might want to be a substantivalist in GR. And indeed, if you want to, uh, to defend substantivalism in the context of GR, you have many uh, arguments at your disposal. For example, GR admits cosmological models uh, where the stress energy tensor is identically zero throughout the universe, uh, while the Einstein tensor is, uh, is not equal zero. So this means that it makes physical sense uh, to think about a universe that's totally deprived of matter and still there is a uh, space-time. Moreover, uh, all these empty cosmological models of space-time can be in principle distinguished in a physical way because all of them would have different uh, features, different curvatures, uh, for, for example which means that the properties of space-time are not ontologically parasitic on uh, matter fields. Finally, you can point out that material fields require space-time in order to be defined, which we can take as the fact that uh, the stress-energy tensor is nothing but a specification of material properties instantiated at space-time points. Um, so, even if uh, uh, you, you can see that you can very well be a substantivalist in general relativity, you uh, realize that uh, uh, the GR substantivalist is a distant cousin of the Newtonian uh, absolutist, of course, uh, because uh, the uh, substantivalism in general relativity is not absolutism anymore, because according to Einstein's equation, uh, the spatiotemporal structures are influenced by the material distribution. So now, uh, general relativistic space-time is not immutable anymore. It's a dynamical uh, feature of the theory. And this dynamicity usually is a, uh, uh, called by physicists uh, background uh, independence. Although this, uh, uh, the characterization of background independence is uh, much more complicated than that. But for the time being, this is something that we'll do. That means that uh, the space-time of uh, general relativity is not anymore a fixed background where things happen, but in some way is an active uh, uh, actor in the play. Um, so far uh, for uh, the uh, sub uh, substantivalists. But how could relationalists uh, uh, counter uh, those arguments that I have so far discussed? For example, they can agree that uh, GR admits uh, those empty cosmological solutions, but they can resist uh, the uh, substantivalist conclusion by saying that those empty uh, solutions are just a mathematical surplus structure of the theory uh, devoid of any actual uh, physical meaning. They can also agree that uh, we need uh, space-time points in order to define material fields, but again, they can just point out that this is a mathematical construction, is something that we need uh, because uh, this is how our mathematics hold, but there is no um, obstacle to physically interpret the picture of general relativity in a relationalist way where fields do not, do not live on space-time, but live on other fields in a relationalist uh, fashion. So this is how physicists such as uh, Carlo Rovelli like to picture uh, the situation in general relativity. 
fields living on fields. Now, these are just, let's say, defensive arguments. However, relationalists can also attack uh, substantivalists in general relativity, and they can do so in a rather strong manner. So in order to see how such argument goes, let me give you some little uh, piece of terminology. So first of all, we will, we will need the notion of diffeomorphism. Now, I don't want to go uh, in any way into technical details. So as a matter of, uh, let's say, metaphor, you can picture a diffeomorphism as a continuous deformation of space-time, which does not alter its intrinsic geometric structure. So basically, if you have a region of space-time where you have some bodies which are related uh, with some distances and angles, whenever you, uh, let's say, uh, deform this region of space-time through a diffeomorphism, you will not touch the distances and the angles among uh, material bodies. Now we can uh, prove a theorem in general relativity, which is called the gauge theorem for general relativity, which basically says that any two models of general relativity which are related by a diffeomorphism represent the same physical situation. Why is it so? Because uh, when we define the observables, the thing that we can measure, we can observe uh, uh, according to the theory, we always do that in terms of distances and angles uh, among material bodies. So whenever a diffeomorphism acts on these kind of things, uh, they do not change the observables uh, uh, associated with with a certain model. So we are ready to spell out this famous argument, which is called the whole argument. So let's start with a very nice and intuitive picture, which is um, uh, compatible with uh, the evolution of general relativity. So here you have a bunch of galaxies that are basically evolving by getting far and far from each other. So we have a picture of a expanding universe. So this dimension is space, this dimension is time. So each and every uh, galaxy follows its own world line when uh, we have this uh, uh, dynamical uh, evolution. Now, you have to consider in that picture a point, a space-time point E, and you have, uh, metaphorically speaking, to carve a hole to consider a region surrounding this point E in which some diffeomorphism acts. So here we have the starting situation. So here you have your galaxy that evolve in time. And here you have your space-time point E that here happens to fall inside the world line of the central galaxy. If we make a diffeomorphism act inside this region, this hole, we see that now the, um, the trajectory of the galaxy does not cross anymore the, uh, the space-time point E. Remember that from an, an observational point of view, all the distances, all the angles that you can measure here, you can measure at the, in the same way here, okay? So there is, a, no, um, there is no experiment that can tell this situation apart from this situation. And now you begin to understand where we are going. Because now I'm asking the question, do the above pictures differ in any respect? Now, of course, the substantivalist will say, well, yes, those are two different situations because in one case, uh, the uh, trajectory of the galaxy passes through a thing, a space-time point, something I am committed to, metaphysically speaking. While in the second case, this, is, uh, uh, this does not happen. But as I said, these two situations are exactly the same from a physical perspective. So a physicist cannot mount, even in principle, 
a, uh, an experiment that can tell the two situations apart. And for sure, uh, the physicist cannot say whether uh, uh, um, the trajectory of the galaxy passes or doesn't pass through E. So now you see that Leibniz uh, returns in full force into the picture because also in this case, if you are committed to the existence of space-time as a, 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 a thing over and above the material bodies, you are very likely committed to the existence of ontologically different states of affairs, which are nonetheless physically indistinguishable. So now, if we want our metaphysics uh, to be sympathetic to our physics, we really do not want such things to happen. We do not want uh, states of affairs that are totally uh, unobservable, even uh, in principle, okay? So, um, as you can see, I hope you appreciate how the, um, the debate between substantivalists and relationalists is shaped by the uh, evolution of the physical uh, theories. There are some common traits, there are some differences. So at this point, the natural prosecution of this kind of debate will be into the context of quantum gravity, okay? And what is quantum gravity? Well, the idea is that uh, modern physics uh, has two very important theory uh, uh, at uh, its disposal. The first is general relativity, and we have already discussed that. But the other is uh, quantum theory. Now, although none of them is uh, a final theory, okay, of everything, if, if you want, both of them capture some important features of reality. And this is why they are uh, so empirically successful. So of course, it is absolutely legitimate to search for a theory that coherently uh, merges these two, uh, these two theories. Now, there are many ways in which we can do that. But the most straightforward way that one can think of is to quantize the general relativistic gravitational field. Okay? But remember that in general relativity, the gravitational field and space-time are two sides of the same coin. So in this sense, this program uh, towards quantum gravity would lead most likely to a quantum theory of space-time. If that's the case, then many, many technical and conceptual problems uh, come uh, to the fore. First of all, quantum space-time is a quantum object. So it is fuzzy. Uh, I think all of you are acquainted with this usual talk that in standard quantum theory, um, uh, quantum objects uh, have no definite uh, position and velocity at the same time, which means that, for example, quantum particles do not have a definite trajectory. Now, mutatis mutandis, the same de uh, definites, uh, definiteness, let's say, problem uh, impacts space-time, because now space-time cannot have any more the nice uh, uh, determinate feature that classical space-time has. Another problem is that when we try to quantize uh, uh, the general relativistic gravitational uh, field, we end up with uh, an equation uh, which is called uh, the wheeler the wheat equation. And the problem with this equation is that it does not feature any kind of uh, temporal parameter whatsoever which means that the dynamics of quantum gravity in this case is frozen, is timeless. And we don't know exactly what kind of sense we can make out of this picture. Moreover, whatever the physical information regarding uh, quantum space-time might be, this information will be encoded 
in a quantum state. And now we know from ordinary quantum theory that quantum states uh, are very strange things that can be uh, subjected to superpositions, uh, to entanglement. Uh, so without going into technical details, this means that if we reify quantum states, if we think that quantum states are something that exists uh, uh, in the real world, then these things are going to have very strange and intuitive uh, um, features, okay? Um, so be it as it may, uh, it seems that such a theory of quantum gravity will just erase uh, space and time as we know them from uh, the physical picture. And now if that is the case, does the substantivalism, relationalism debate still make sense? Or perhaps we should concentrate on other conceptual questions such as, I don't know, how does uh, the appearance of uh, a classical, well-behaved, definite space-time come from a fundamental ontological level where there is no space-time whatsoever? Well, I don't know how to answer these questions because this is uh, just work in progress. So uh, it might be the case that once we have a more clear grasp on a theory of quantum gravity, this uh, substantivalism, relationalism debate will uh, come back again full force. This is still an ongoing enterprise to which both physicists and philosophers are actually uh, and actively uh, engaged. So my point is that uh, I hope you appreciate how uh, a philosophical and metaphysical debate can be let's say, shaped uh, and addressed in the context of uh, the development of physical theory. And this is all I wanted uh, to say. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Antonio, uh, for, for your interesting talk. Uh, so now's the time for uh, the questions from the audiences. Uh, if you have a question, I already see that someone raised a hand, so uh, I, I will unmute you in a second, but for others, uh, if you can uh, look at Mr. Frank, this is the best way to, to, to draw my attention. If, uh, if you have problems with finding the proper button, you can always type on the chat room that you, that you want to ask a question. So uh, the first question is for, from Mr. Frank Zenka, and I am unmuting you now. Okay, I, I think this works. Uh, Antonio, grazie uh, mille. Thanks very much. Uh, very, very clear. Uh, very glad that, that you that you kept the technicalities out there. And I, I'm gaming this because I have to leave, but I want to say something. Um, it's more a comment, really. So from from what you show us, I think it becomes very clear that the debate between relationalism and substantivism, substantivism, you know what I mean it's really revealed as an ontological debate. So, so one that, that you cannot solve but on empirical considerations. And even as, as you suggest, as we go on uh, into theories that I get to develop, it looks very unclear whether the question really is meaningful. So I just want to stress this, that, that you, you show that, that something is, is now properly understood as an ontological disagreement and has, not, has no distinct physical consequences. So that, that, that itself is a result, I think, that needs to, deserve stress. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, you are right, uh, uh, at least in the context of classical and relativistic physics. Uh, um, for sure, the physics uh, can help us uh, make uh, the debate clearer so that we agree on what we are talking about. But there is still a huge component that uh, cannot be decided by uh, physics alone. Uh, so you are absolutely right that, uh, uh, well, at, at this point, uh, uh, we cannot settle the debate by uh, physical consideration. The hope is that in future with a theory of quantum gravity uh, at hand, uh, whenever this is going to happen, because at the moment we don't have the faintest idea of how 
a theory of quantum gravity should look, should look like. But the hope is that perhaps we will have some uh, revolutionary key insights from that theory that uh, will leak into the metaphysical side of the debate. But this is just wishful thinking. If uh, uh, we, we think that uh, the debate will go exactly in the same direction as in the previous cases, then we have to be prepared on the fact that this debate will go on forever, irrespective of the physical findings. So thank you very much for your remark. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, okay, I see that uh, we have a question. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Antonio, a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I have a question about your uh, about the whole argument uh, that you presented uh, so nicely. I First of all, I would like to add something to the argument as you obviously are perfectly aware of, the argument is uh, very often cast in terms of uh, determinism and indeterminism, as opposed to the original Leibnizian shift, which is, which is usually uh, presented in the way that it somehow affects the, the that, that it presents us with two indistinguishable uh, uh, cases which are ontologically different. But in the case of the whole argument, it seems that it's even even uh, even more uh, troublesome. The case is even more troublesome because we, here we have a situation in which the situation, the the, the, the physical, I mean the the, the, the whole physical uh, situation outside the hole is exactly the same as it was before, but inside the hole there's this shift. So it's it seems as if there, there is some sort of indeterminism going on here. But my question is, uh, is about uh, one particular response to the whole argument on behalf of substantivalism, which again, you, 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 you are quite familiar with. Uh, this is the position known as uh, sophisticated substantivalism, which actually denies that we have somehow to, to pick and identify points in, the, uh, in these two diffeomorphically related uh, models just simply by fiat, by saying, oh, this is the same point that I had in mind before, but rather we should kind of follow, we should follow in, in order to identify points in the transformed, diffeomorphically transformed model, you have to follow the physics, so to speak. So you have to, to find the point which actually possesses the same metric property as the original one. And if you do that, it turns out that actually this point will possess the exact same physical property. So nothing really changes. So what are your thoughts about this particular um, solution to the whole argument? Are you, are you uh, convinced by it or? <laughs> okay, no, thank you very much. Of course, uh, in, in my presentation, I just scratched the, the surface. Uh, perhaps uh, I can uh, uh, just show to the audience what uh, uh, you mean by this problem with determinism, if you can see that. So the idea that uh, Tomas has brought to the table is that uh, the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, ambiguity that is uh, at, uh, at play in the general relativistic case is much more troublesome than the uh, classical case. Why is it so? Because um, we can um, imagine that the dynamics of general relativity can be given once and for all once we specify all the physical data on a spatial uh, hypersurface. So uh, if the theory is deterministic, then uh, by uh, specifying uh, initial data on this surface, then the entire dynamical uh, evolution of the model will come up uh, automatically because of the terms. Now, if you are a, a substantivalist and you are presented with these two different situation and you insist that these two situations are different, then you must be prepared to say that uh, even if you specify as precisely as you want the initial data on this surface, which is the same in both models, 
this is not enough to single out one of the models uh, between the two, which means that the theory will be committed to indeterminism, which is something that really we do not want. So uh, this is why the whole argument in general relativity is uh, even is, is, is very uh, troublesome for uh, substantivalists. Now, uh, of course, in presenting uh, this problem, uh, as I told you, I just scratched the, the surface. And uh, of course, there are many possible uh, answers that the sub substantivalist can come up to. And one of the answers is to say, hey, there is um, no fact of the matter where the point uh, that we called uh, uh, E has uh, a definite uh, identity, okay? So uh, this is uh, uh, one way in which we can dodge the, uh, the kind of uh, um, uh, challenge that we are doing, because if we do so, then we have some way to reestablish uh, some sort of physical equivalence between the, the two models. Or we can just say, no, there is just one way in which uh, uh, we can have the model, and it is the one in which the um, the trajectory passes through E, because it is essential that he that he has uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, feature. So, among the two, only one is metaphysically possible. Now, honestly, I find this second line of thought that can be traced back to the work of Tim Modlin uh, too strong because it just places uh, metaphysical constraints on uh, the physics, okay? So I will go uh, towards some sort of more sophisticated substantivalism that tends to deny uh, this, um, uh, this intrinsic identity of space-time point, thus reestablishing a notion of determinism. And for the audience, I can say that you did some work in this, uh, in this sense. Uh, perhaps you are an, an essentialist too, but a much more moderate one. For, so for, for those in the audience who are interested in uh, this debate, in the, in the, in the modern, uh, let's say, replies to uh, the whole argument, they can for sure refer to uh, your uh, work on that. So you are absolutely right. I, and I tend to be a sophisticated substantivalist leaving aside essentialist uh, kind of underpinnings, uh, for sure the, the strongest one by, by modeling is out of question in my opinion. So thank you, thank you for your question. Okay, thank you uh, for a very interesting question and a very interesting response. Uh, uh, so does anyone else have a question? If not, I have a question. Uh, I would like to reverse the first question. I mean, th there was uh, this, this uh, voice that we have here, a purely metaphysical problem, which we cannot uh, solve by, uh, by, by means of physics. Um, I hope that I did not miss anything in your talk and answers. Uh, but could you uh, tell me, do you see in which way perhaps metaphysics here uh, inspire and motivates uh, physics. What I mean here is that metaphysical problems, uh, metaphysical conceptions are, are also are all usually called metaphysicals because, because we cannot solve them by physical means. But metaphysics often inspires certain physical programs, like it was evident in, in, in development of quantum mechanics, for example. Uh, so can you say that for that today uh, we can see one uh, metaphysical attitude uh, about uh, space-time motivating, uh, I probably not a, not a clever example, but loop quantum gravity and the other string theory or something like this, or it, this metaphysics has no relation on development of physics whatsoever? Uh, no, I think that especially in uh, recent times when, uh, let's say, work on a theory of quantum gravity has started, we have uh, experienced a resurgence uh, in, uh, I will say, a sort of, um, um, let's say, 
natural philosophy approach uh, to the development of uh, uh, physical theories. So when I uh, say natural philosophy approach, I'm thinking about Newton. So basically, as I uh, hope I made uh, a bit clear, uh, for Newton, the problem of describing uh, uh, inertial motion, which is a physical problem, had uh, to be, uh, let's say, tackled, uh, first of all, by considering uh, some metaphysical uh, some metaphysical consideration side by side. Uh, and, and that's why he started asking himself, does relational motion uh, do the, its job in uh, helping us define inertial motion or not? And when he found that it is not, he started postulating an absolute space for physical purposes, that is for defining inertial motions. So in Newton's uh, kind of uh, uh, work, you can see that metaphysics and physics go hand in hand. They, they are, uh, let's say, developed side by side. Now, this kind of approach perhaps has been uh, lost uh, in uh, subsequent times. And in my opinion, when we have the most uh, uh, clear example of uh, this uh, totally uh, detached, this total detachment between metaphysics and physics in the development of quantum physics, uh, where basically the founding fathers of quantum physics uh, just uh, laid down their theory in terms of postulates uh, regarding measurement. So leaving aside any kind of consideration regarding ontology, how the world has to be. Um, so, and uh, because of that uh, approach, we today find very difficult to make sense of quantum theory as a theory of the outside world. I mean, if we want to be realists with respect to quantum theory, we have problems. We can be, let's say, instrumentalist and don't ask any ontological question about the theory. But if we want to be realist and we ask uh, how uh, does the world have to be in order for quantum mechanics to be real? We don't know exactly. Uh, so you see that uh, uh, putting aside these uh, metaphysical considerations when developing a physical theory has bad consequences. Uh, now, recently, uh, when uh, quantum gravity has started entering uh, the physical arena, we have seen many people that uh, did not uh, uh, use an approach which is just shut up and calculate. They used approaches where they asked more, let's say, uh, metaphysical questions. So for example, uh, if you uh, think about physicists like uh, Raphael Sorkin that has developed uh, a theory uh, or a proposal for a theory of quantum gravity, which is called causal set theory, uh, well, basically, he started from the idea that perhaps space and time are not that real, are not ontologically fundamental. So he wanted to construct a theory where the fundamental uh, bits of reality are not space-time points, but are just uh, these uh, primitive events, okay? Um, so there is a sense in which uh, uh, now more than ever, we need metaphysics uh, to enter uh, the development of uh, physical, uh, physical uh, theories, because we need in some sense to have clear uh, some of the conceptual foundations uh, on which we want to build our theory. So these two things uh, has to go hand in hand. So I think that uh, uh, recently metaphysics has entered uh, the physical uh, ground, uh, helping uh, many physicists to uh, do uh, their job. So I hope this answers your question. Yeah, to a large extent. Uh, yes, thank you very much for it. Thank you, Antonio, for your thank you. and uh, patient in answering us. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the questions and thank all of you uh, who participated in our meeting. Uh, uh, it was an interesting experience to have a meeting online. Still, I hope that, that most of us will manage to, to, to meet next time in person. We will see. Thank you and have a nice evening. Okay. Bye.